Hey guys, this is Kilty and Matt, and we are amping and prepping for the biggest storm that Colorado's front range is going to get this season. Maybe 50 inches of powder. Dun, We're da, super da, da. stoked. And of course, we'll be drinking mud water to prep and warm up so that we can charge the snow. You. Hey, Kilty and Matt, hope that you got some fresh pow pow. Thanks for sending that voice memo in. Welcome to Trends with Benefits. My name is Kyle Tierman. And if you want to send a voice memo into us to be played on this podcast, just bust out your phone, record less than a minute of audio. Let us know who you are, where you're listening from, where you love drinking your mud. And if we play it, we'll send you a free box of mud. You can just email those voice memos to podcast at mudwtr.com. That's podcast at mudwtr.com. And you can go to trendswithbenefits.com to check out all of our stories. It's our media arm. So we've got everything from psychedelics to adventure to well-being all at trendswithbenefits.com. This episode of the podcast is with Dr. Rick Hansen. Dr. Rick Hansen is a psychologist and New York Times bestselling author. He's been an invited speaker at NASA, Oxford, Stanford, Harvard, and meditation centers worldwide. His books are available in 28 languages, including Resilient, Hardwiring Happiness, Buddha's Brain, Just One Thing, Mother Nurture, and Neurodharma. His work has been featured on BBC, CBS, and NPR. He speaks with the kind of clarity and relaxed wisdom that one can only attain from years and years of thinking and meditating. So please welcome to the show, Dr. Rick Hansen. I'm going to press record right, right now because we're already, uh, we're burning good podcast wood. Um, so when did you start uh, rock climbing? I started, uh, I was 21. Uh, I was a really shy, dorky kid who did not feel athletic. I was very young for my grade. My dad, who had been born on a ranch in 1918 and was a real cowboy, he was pretty hardcore. But the idea of throwing a baseball back and forth with his kid, which is sort of unfamiliar to him in a way. So that was me going through school. And I actually had this total breakthrough. I was about 11 years old. It was my first Boy Scout camp out, Joshua Tree National Park, which is deeply meaningful and sacred to me. I've spent a lot of time there. I've um, gone on good trips there in more ways than one. And um, Excellent just, rock climbing too. Yeah, I just broke out. I scrambled. I, I, I scrambled away from the other kids. And I suddenly found myself on these big boulders moving like a badass, you know, in my 11 year old kind of way. And it totally opened a door for me about who I was and who I could be. And that kind of set me on my way. And then I began climbing pretty seriously uh, as a weekend warrior. Uh, I got uh, complimented one time by a really good climbing guide. He said, well, you're one of the best I've ever seen off the couch. <laughs> <That's>, <laughs> and that was high praise. That's like a Hey, that was really good for you. <laughs> for me, it was really yeah. good for a middle-aged weekend warrior. That was pretty high praise. Anyway, so that's been my story. And it's there's nothing like it. As you know, I've as we were saying, I've never stood on a surfboard. I love watching surfing. There's something about it that's mesmerizing to me and scary, dangerous. You know, the it's not it's like it's not like the cliff is moving. I'm the right when you're rock climbing, it's usually stable unless something has gone terribly wrong. Uh, Surfing so. and and rock climbing, though, are both culturally very similar hmm. in the way that there's this kind of reverence and respect just for the medium. Like yeah. uh, in baseball or football or basketball, it's all about the star of the show who is the person. Hmm. Whereas more often than not, people are looking at that wall face. I've been to Yosemite and stood out in that meadow and have seen El Capitan. And you can just watch that thing all day long. And the different shades of sun that come across the face um, in some ways looks like a huge wave. And I don't know many other sports where spectators will just watch the thing without the athlete doing it. You don't have a lot of tennis spectators just looking at the court without anyone playing. That's deeply insightful, Kyle. 
That's very cool. And it's hard there's, to think. Yeah, it also on. creates a kind of humility. I think that like rock climbing and surfing, there's mm-hmm. this kind of, um, yeah, just respect for the outdoors and and the hero of the whole shot is the environment. Yeah, that's great. And it's bigger than you. I mean, it it's a beast. You know, maybe it's weird to say it, but maybe rodeo is like that because you watch the horse or the bull, right? I mean, it, and you have respect for the potency, the power of that beast, whether it's a wave or a cliff or a, or a horse, let's say. Wow. That's, that's a good one. Yeah. So do, were you doing a lot of trips out to Yosemite? Oh, yeah. Um, so I, I never got great, great. I mean, there are levels of climbing. and um, But for certainly my time, I mean, I was reasonably good at it. I would go to Yosemite, Takeets Rock, uh, down by Southern California where I lived, uh, out by Idlewild, Joshua Tree, definitely. Climbed in Colorado, the East Coast a little bit. Uh, you know, I... I Got good enough to get into some very hairy situations more than once. And and for me as well, that's something I imagine, I guess, about surfing. And as a psychologist, I love these environments where uh, usually you're not in mortal peril, hopefully not, but you feel scared. And if you mess up, bad things can happen. And it calls you to function under pressure with a cool head again and again and again, which is, of course, useful in general and definitely during the time of corona, right, that we're in the middle of right now. Yeah. I wanted to ask you about that um, and th- those moments where you are pushing yourself beyond your capability. Um, and I'll talk about it in my experience surfing. Um, and then you can talk about it with rock climbing. And, and I'd just like to hear your insight around what is happening um, on the level of the brain in this in these moments? So, in in big wave surfing, um, one of the more dangerous things that can happen to you is um, getting what's called a two wave hold down, where you fall on a wave and then you get pushed down so deep that you can't come up for air before the next wave lands on top of you. Um, and it's very dark and it's very lonely. And a lot of surfers who I interview, I, I talk to a ton of big wave surfers. They talk about um, the happy place. So mm-hmm. they will go to a happy place in their mind to try and get through that situation. Because really, you're rarely going to be underwater for more than 30 seconds to a minute, which most mm-hmm. people could do, you know, they could hold their breaths okay in that situation. Mm-hmm. But when the panic starts to come, it can feel like an eternity. And um, one thing that that surfers need to watch, though, is to both keep an eye on going to that happy, calm place, but also maintaining awareness of the situation that they're in in that moment. Mm. Because you can't just hang out underwater. There's a, a point we need to start climbing up your leash. We need to start swimming. And you need to know when to act in those moments. And um, I wanted to ask you about the experience of disassociating in mm. moments of intensity. And what's actually going on 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 the mind level when because I've actually had the, that experience where I'm deep underwater and I'm like, am I really here or am mm. I back at my house right now? And how did yeah. I get here? And and it's just so easy for the brain to ditch out. And I was wondering if you could speak to that. Have you thought about that in terms of trauma and people's reactions to trauma? I haven't, but I know oh, that that's what happens. Yeah. So in a way, you're, you're, you remind me of dissociation, a classic trauma response where – and you can just sort of see it, animals in the wild like the deer or whatever it is in Africa suddenly in the, in the jaws of the cheetah. Uh, and you could just see the deer kind of just relaxing and giving up. Uh, and there is that way in which in trauma we naturally – dissociate. We go away and people talk about that. They, they talk about as if they were watching the assault or the terrible accident or the, the explosion in Iraq from far, far away. And it is a coping response. The problem is uh, that it can become the new normal. And it involves technically probably hyperactivation of the parasympathetic branch of the nervous system, which we'd normally draw upon for calm, easy strength and just taking it easy. It's called the rest and digest branch of the nervous system in distinction to this fight or flight branch, as it were. But too much 
parasympathetic activation can lead to a, lead to a freeze response. And literally in certain fish, uh, they will go into a playing dead response, a freeze response to evade a predator. So the predator won't notice them anymore, won't see them even. But when they freeze, they start, they sink to the bottom of the lake where there's less oxygen and then they die of asphyxiation because they can't get enough air down there enough. You know, isn't it wild? That's a metaphor for big wave surfing if I've ever heard. Yeah. One. You don't want to do that. Um, I think you're also speaking to it, this funny thing, you know, uh, what happens when we drop into these really hyper enlightened states? Uh, there's a kind of famous story in Buddhism of an uh, interaction between the Buddha and the seeker named Bahia. I'll tell you the story if it's okay, because there's a really deep teaching in it. It's kind of a famous story. So this seeker who is really quite mature in his practice comes to see the Buddha and implores him to give his teaching. The Buddha says several times, no, Bahia, sorry, not now. We've come to the town for alms. I'm busy. Can't do it. But he asks him a third time. Then the Buddha responds. He says, Bahia, you should train yourself thus. In the seeing, let there be only the seeing. In the thinking, only the thinking. In the sensing, only the think sensing. And when for you, there is only hearing in the hearing, seeing in the seeing, then there is no you there. There is no self there. When there is no self there, no self being constructed, added in the moment, there's no self anywhere. And that, just that, is the end of all suffering. Whoa. And then on the basis of that, Bahia supposedly was awakened on the spot. That's great. The teaching right there is very summary, isn't it? You know, in the surfing, let there be only the surfing. In the climbing, only the climbing. In the speaking, only the speaking. I mean, that's a really beautiful place to drop into. And as the sutta concludes, Bahia wandered off and didn't notice a female cow who was protecting her calf and she killed him. And so <laughs> there is that side of it too. <laughs> we don't want to be so tripped out in these exotic enlightened states that we're not able to, you know, zip or fly or, you know, lock the front door, or notice the red light. What's, uh, that so saying, I think both are true. what's that saying? Trust in Allah, but tie your camel to the post? Yeah. Something like that, or Jack Cornfield calls it after the ecstasy, the laundry. You know? <laughs> I love that. Yeah. Have you had any experiences like that rock climbing? I've definitely had experiences of flow while climbing, and I've had experiences. I had a, a very profound experience. I actually don't talk about very much, but I'm willing to talk about it with you. I, I can feel that. I'm nearly drowning while skin diving off the coast of Catalina in Southern California. I was a camp counselor. I was 16. And the very short version is that I foolishly uh, tried to swim through a whole bunch of kelp thinking that it would just be a little bit and I could get through it. And I got trapped in it. And I began to drown. I panicked um, <clears throat> for an interminable amount of time. I have no idea how long. I just thrashed and panicked. And, and then what happened was I just shifted. Something changed, very radically changed. And I was in a completely altered state of being. There was no longer any fear. I was completely calm. And there was this deep clarity that I simply needed to work my way out of the situation. So at that point, because I'd panicked, my mask was around my throat. I'd lost, I'd lost a fin. The snorkel had been ripped out of my mouth. And I very slowly just began plucking the kelp off my body because I'd gotten tightened in it like a Chinese finger puzzle. You know, you get tightened, the harder you pull. And I just slowly kicked my way through it and then cleared it. I had about 10 more feet of water. I can remember seeing right now the silvery surface of the water above me with no panic or stress. I just swam up toward it, cleared the surface, took my first breath, and then boom, Rick came back. The ordinary personality returned. And I'd been underwater, I'm sure, for at least a minute or so. It was a really pretty serious situation. So I've had a moment like that, definitely. Um, climbing, uh, I just, you know, a lot of experiences of being tuned in, being dialed in. Also experiences of knowing that if I messed up, I would die. I don't like those moments, you know, been through those. And there, it is interesting, too. There's a kind of a famous essay that draws parallels between climbing, and I suspect there would be similar ones to surfing, and deep contemplative practice. These rhythms of action and rest, camaraderie with others, uh, a, a kind of uh, spareness of sensory input. You know, the, the cliff is just 
kind of what it is, the, the ocean surface, the water surface, it's just kind of what it is. It's like facing a wall in Zen practice, maybe something like that. And many people report, I bet you've had your experiences uh, where it's as if they're in deep meditation, right? Something really deep is coming in. Have you had that? Has that happened for you? Very much so. Yeah. Um, and just to speak on what, what you were talking about, I did a week long silent meditation um, last year at Mount Madonna with Adi Ashanti. Yeah, deep. And I was uh, I was there and um, he does satsangs in the evening. And I had just gotten over this big injury. I was kite surfing and I got thrown across the beach and broke my arm. And it was uh, pretty scary. And I was having a, a bit of kind of like trauma reaction from it. Yeah. And I asked him what he would recommend to get through that. And he said that he was a very avid rock climber growing up. I don't know mm -hmm. if you knew that. But I didn't know. I, yeah, I have a, a close friend of mine is a close friend of his, and I'd heard a little bit about that. He's quite an athlete. Yeah. And he recommended to me that I go through that situation of trauma in my mind again and again until I didn't have that tightening response to it anymore. And I did that for a number of months, and it really helped. I was... Um, I was blown away by how much those little mental exercises yeah. had such a profound impact on the brain level, which yeah. speaks to a lot of the work that you do um, and that TED talk that you did. Oh, yeah. You know, all the time, but especially when things fall apart, we're left with our practice. We're left with what we've grown inside ourselves, hardwired into our body, especially the brain, you know, qualities of grit and gratitude and happiness and love and so on. And um, I'm just kind of bowled over routinely ab about the ways in which many people are crystal clear about being competent externally directed. Whatever it is, you know, they're going to dial in their physical setting, their home. They're going to um, make sure they know how to drive a car well. They want to make sure they know how to, you know, use Excel spreadsheets or something like that really well. But when it comes to internally directed competence, right, competence, skillfulness with their own thoughts, their own feelings, what it's like to be them moment to moment to moment, for some reason, they just push that away or dismiss it or look down on it as if it's some sort of a luxury item for self-indulgent yuppies. And I just think, no, that's actually where the most courage is called for. It's in the inner waves, right? Um, you, do you know Jamal Yogis? Do you know yeah, Jamal? I do. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, you know, he has his book, All Our Waves Are Water, and it's, it's like that, you know, um, Saltwater Buddha, right? That's kind of a great classic. And, um, you know, I just think about how the waves in our own minds, a lot of times people – are afraid of them, they turn away from them, or they don't they don't know how to surf them, you know, to use that metaphor. And yet that's where we live, right? We live in our own experience 24-7. We're in our experience in a way more than we're in different settings. And so if there's any place to be competent, to to take agency, to to do what you can, right? It's in your innermost being. Anyway, that's how it seems to me. I like that a lot. I also, um, I kind of diverted from your question around um, those moments uh, in the water that are really great. I took a story and told you about one of the more horrible moments, but um, I did just want to um, underscore that point because we kind of skipped over it. And I think that it's a really special place on the um, span of human consciousness to be, right? Like those moments mm -hmm. of flow and awe and it's, and yeah. It's hard to talk about them because it's so easy for it to come off as cheesy, but mm -hmm. it's it's a really special place. And most of us yeah. have experienced it on one level or another. And one thing that I've found, um, and, and I would love for you to speak to this a bit more because I just don't have the words. Um, but one thing that I found that drops away in those moments, like when you're having a really great surf session, is any... Um, reference to comparison and mm. comparing yourself to others. And I find that it's so often that we can just become trapped in that comparative state, 
Like that is a the the mo of us is us in reference to another person, and right. that breeds so much suffering. And yeah. the moments of just awe and being in the flow are really just moments of freedom from that mind for a little while. There's a lot about that. Uh, tell me what you think about this. So on the one hand, it's actually, we evolved in a sense, in part, to compare ourselves to others in the sense that uh, we as a species until about 10,000 years ago when agriculture came in, have always lived in small bands of about 40 or 50 people most of our lives. So, wow. And in those settings, whether it's 300,000 years of Homo sapiens or another couple million years before that of our hominid immediate tool manufacturing ancestors, um, it, it was necessary to compare yourself to others, to make sure that you got your fair share and not more than your fair share, to see how you were doing, to make sure you had status. I've been critical of myself for still being um, vulnerable to feeling less than others. I think, wow, Rick, you've been at it for a while. Why are you still feeling inadequate? But, which just made me feel more inadequate. <laughs> <You know? laughs> like add on, add on, self-hate. And I just, it, it weirdly dorky, it helped me to realize that, of course, we're designed to, to do social comparison, just like you say. So that would be part one, just to accept that, you know, and then if we if we fight it, it tends to make it worse. But that's part one. Part two, you make me think about um, this piece of material that's really some of the latest, coolest neuroscience I know, which has to do with the sense of things as a whole. So the structure of social comparison is two parts. You know, there's you, then there's the other, then maybe there's an imagined observing audience who likes them more than you gives them higher ratings than yours, right? Uh, and then it becomes parts struggling with parts. That's the structure of stress and suffering. So when we go into the sense of experience as a whole, parts uh, drop out. We're aware of different elements, but they just become merged into a larger whole, right? And one way into that is to be aware of the body, just the body as a whole, the whole body, and naturally as an athlete, using your whole body, you know, I'm imagining to serve, uh, you really are very much in that. Same with rock climbing, you know, so on. Um, when you do that neurologically, what happens is activity decreases in the midline of your brain, the, the upper midline of the cortex, especially in the default mode network, so-called in the middle and spreading to the sides uh, toward the back. And that activation in the default mode network is the basis of comparing mind, anxious rumination, and so forth. So when activity in those circuits decreases, when it gets quiet, activity in circuits on the sides of your brain, especially right-sided for right-handed people, which involves with gestalt processing, holistic processing, gets active. And when that happens, it naturally draws you into the present because these midline networks are involved in mental time travel. It's called thinking about the future, obsessing about the past, comparing yourself to others in different situations or projecting that forward, for example, that mental time travel process gets quieter and you come right into the present. Also, there's a lot of selfing that goes on that's supported by those midline networks, including inside the ruminator, you know, <laughs> the default mode network. And so like in that Buddhist teaching, you know, the Buddhist teaching to Bahia, when there's just you, when, when there's just a moment in the moment, there's just the present in the present, the experience in the, in the experience. Then there's much less sense of ego, me, myself, and I, my precious, right? There, that's awesome. And so when you talk about those moments of, let's say, flow, I'm imagining that there's a real sense of yourself as a whole and even a sense of just everything as a whole, which is the basis for awe, to have a sense of the vastness altogether, right? Nothing left out. And one of the reasons why that works, just to finish, I guess, is based on what in the world is going on, the, on in the brain meanwhile. And to me, what's great about that is you can train in it. You can repeatedly train in a sense of wholeness in your body and a sense of allness. These are two practices in my book that has seven practices in it, neurodharma, uh, wholeness and allness. And as you do that, it's fantastic. More and more, you could just drop in when you want. 
You can still function, obviously. Uh, you could put two steps in front of another, each other sequentially. But overall, wow, it's it's great to be the whole rather than the part. It very much is. And one uh, insight that I've been chewing on quite a bit uh, recently is that is the the ability of to train yourself in these yeah. practices and that by training yourself you can actually experience more of these mental states um to a degree that is just much more frequent than yeah. if you didn't um to the level of like the comparison i would use is athletics is athletics like there are people who train every day in athletics and they're going to be that much stronger than you mm -hmm. if you don't but yeah. people tend to overlook that um trained ability in the mind and um i appreciate the way that you phrase um a lot of your teachings in um that you say look these are trainable skills yeah and um, these are trainable skills, and here's how to start. So from the level of, how, of, of teaching people how to start training themselves to compare less and be a part mm. of that whole space more, you yeah. mentioned feeling into the body. Can you speak yeah. on that a bit more? Well, sure. And, and I love your focus here uh, on basically practice. Right, I, I'm, I'm, I'm in. A I'm, I'm I'm totally in because I suffer from all this shit. So I'm like, this is super important, everyone. <laughs> Let's cool. figure it out. <laughs> well, suffering's a motivator, man. It's motivated me. Yeah, and sure. and also just I I, I don't want to um, cut you off. I want to let you get into this next part. But I've also for a number of years experienced um, and 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 practiced with. Uh, oh, these are all very like experienced practice like. I've done psychedelics quite a bit yeah. when I when I was younger and I experienced a lot of these states but they were so much less I found them to be so much less durable than yeah. incorporating these practices and when I yeah. did something like a week long silent meditation by the end of it I thought okay this is jedi training this isn't just getting shot up to the top of the mountain and looking around for 4 to 6 hours and then coming back down this is a, a, a real athletic training that is tends to be a lot less sexy, but is just so much more helpful long term. Hmm. Well, I'd super appreciate what you're what you're talking about, Kyle. And and one reason I wanted to talk with you is that you have developed mastery. You're in the process of that in a particular area, and I'm really interested in the process of getting better at things. Not because we're bad as we are, but as we get better at things, uh, we're more able to help other people and we're more able to help ourselves. And the journey itself is worth taking. It's really interesting to develop and cultivate, learn and grow. And I actually had kind of a breakthrough when I was about 15. I was reading Dune at the time, the great sci-fi novel. And it's relevant because the main character was my age, you know, when the book starts, Paul Madib. And also... Um, there's such an emphasis in that book on training, mental training, and also physical combat training. Typically, of course, it would appeal to me as a kid, you know, knife fighting, and stuff like that. And I realized that no matter how miserable I'd been or was in the moment, every day in my high school with my family, with the other kids, I could grow a little every day. I could learn a little. I could get less freaked out around girls. I could be less freaked out around my parents. I could, you know, let go of a little crud. I could grow a little every day. And that was incredibly hopeful. That was so hopeful. Um, and it made it clear that if learning broadly is the strength of strengths, because it's the one we tap to grow the rest of our strengths, then learning how to learn was the most important learning of all. And that kind of set me on my way. Not so much intellectual learning, although, you know, I got a PhD, I'm decent at that. But I really mean it emotional learning, social learning, somatic learning, motivational learning, attitudinal learning. That's the learning that matters most. So that's kind of what we're talking about here. And it reminds me of this quote from Gurdjieff about psychedelics, which I've done a, quite a lot of myself. And 
Um, sometimes it was entertaining. Sometimes it was, you know, really uncomfortable. And sometimes it was deeply healing and deeply meaningful. Uh, so he said psychedelics are like a telescope. They can show you what's possible, but then you have to walk there on your own. Just like you said, right? Uh, and here's a quote I think about from Milarepa, this great Tibetan adept about a thousand years ago. He said, describing his own life, like his life of practice, and you could apply this to anything, getting a little bit better at anything. He said, in the beginning, nothing came. In the middle, nothing stayed. In the end, nothing left. And that really summarizes the journey, doesn't it? So in the middle, you know, we're able to experience things, maybe based on activities at the moment or a person we're talking with or a meditation we're doing. We experience it in the moment, but a few minutes later, a few days later, it's gone. Right, it hasn't stayed, but with practice, again and again, and now we understand with modern neuroscience how that's happening. What's called experience-dependent neuroplasticity, uh, which we can help from the inside out ourselves. In what's positive neuroplasticity, we can help ourselves steepen our growth curve in any domain, whether it's a physical activity. We want to help ourselves train in more rapidly, let's say, or something interpersonal with another individual. You know, we want to become more skillful with our partner or our kids or with our own mind. You know, we can acquire that over time. We can help ourselves grow over time so that things actually stick around. So you shift into trait well-being, trait inner peace, trait resilience, right? You can really, really grow that over time. And yeah, what do you think about all that? Well, a quote that I um, wrote down that you um, said that that has been um, repeated in my mind since I saw it was passing mental states, lasting neural traits. Yeah, and um, regarding that critical self talk and that um, comparison that is just so prevalent today now more than ever with social media, mm-hmm. what what single practice would you recommend to someone who is plagued by that self-reference mm-hmm. and comparison and doesn't actually know the first step to take? It's great. Um, so I'm a longtime therapist and, and, and I've had long-standing feelings of inadequacy in comparison to others, the cool kids, you know, I felt left out a lot, you know, the runt of the litter, as my dad would put it, growing up on a ranch in North Dakota. Uh, First and foremost, it's to recognize the difference between self-criticism and self-guidance and to feel it. The part of you that is harsh, punitive, like an inner bully, that's pounding on you, be better, be better, you failure. Bleh. And to realize that, wait a minute here, I can truly develop myself. I truly can get better at whatever my thing is without the added burden of that inner asshole yelling at me. On the other hand, I can have inner guides, uh, some of whom are very nurturing and sweet. Others are like tough but friendly coaches. Uh, who know nonsense, but they're not trying to tear you down. They're really trying to build you up. And that's right there, a really big difference. People think sometimes that if I'm not hard on myself, I'm going to lose my edge. And that's BS. Long-term, being hard on yourself will, will wear down your edge. People who are peak performers over the long haul, over the long run of a career, fundamentally have attitudes of compassion and support and kindness and appreciation toward themselves. So that distinction right there might sound kind of abstract, but it's a fundamental difference. And to really hold on to the truth that you can deal with challenges, you can be tough, you right? You can be a top level kind of person in your work while being compassionate and supportive and encouraging toward yourself rather than mean and destructive. I think that's a big one. Another big one for me is at the end of the day, no one remembers and no one cares. (laughs) We're all going to (laughs) die. You know? And so at the end of the day, it's such a cliche, but you got to do it for yourself, right? And um, to realize that 
you just cannot control what the crowd says. On the one hand, think of all the the great geniuses and artists and whatnot over throughout history who were ignored during their own lifetime. Van Gogh died in poverty, whatever. Think of all the people these days and who shall be nameless, and we look at their fame and we think to ourselves, really? Like, really? That's what you're famous for? Whoa. Right. So at the end of the day, I think for me, at least, it's just fundamental to focus on intrinsic values. Am I doing the best I can? Am I getting better every day? Am I bringing a whole heart to this? Am I not being an asshole? You know, am I sincere? I think that's really important. I, uh, I was listening to Tim Ferriss podcast once, and he talked about that and how he thought that that negative self-talk and really self-loathing um, was a trait of his. It was a tool that he, and he was afraid that if he softened that grip on it, he would lose his edge. But he said he realized that um, it was like having a knife with no handle. Mm. And what you really yeah. want is a knife where you have a nice handle to hold on to. Yeah. You know, it's funny. Someone was telling me this a uh, little earlier today that their teacher had said to them that if someone in your life treated you like you treat yourself, you would get rid of them in your life, right? And yet, routinely, we don't get rid of, (laughs) as it were, how we treat ourselves. And that, yeah. What do you say on um, the level of neuroscience to someone mm-hmm. who says, yeah, but I've been thinking this way my entire life. How am I supposed to change now that I'm 30, 40, 50, 60 years old? I would say first from both a neuroscience standpoint and a life standpoint, you have to take charge of your own mind. There's no replacement for that. It's like, what's your relationship to your own mind? And it's a gut check for a lot of people. They realize that if their car breaks down, they've got to step up to it and deal it, deal with it. But with regard to their own mind, they're passive. They're inert. Uh, they, they complain about the way it is, but they don't step up to it. And there's no replacement for that, uh, which to me gives um, credibility and uh, grounding to these practices. They're not airy-fairy. They're not wussy. They're not, you know, some sort of luxury indulgence. They're hardcore. And a lot of people will not bring the muscle and the will and the character to inner practice, right, that they might bring to other things. So that's point one. I don't mean to say that to feed the inner critic in people or to be mean or anything myself, but just I've been a therapist for a really long time. It's made me more compassionate, but it's also made me blunter, you know, <laughs> right? You just got, you got to, you got to, you got to practice with it. Okay. Now the practice itself is not that hard to do and it's rewarding it. And, and you can see the fruits of it. Step one is to step back rather than being identified with that inner critic. Can you witness it? Can you disidentify from it? Can you uh, rest in a certain spaciousness of awareness in which you watch that critic yelling at you? Can you label it? The inner critic, the inner gremlin, you know, give it a funny name, like out of a Disney, you know, cartoon character, Simon Legree sort of villain, right? That is huge there. Okay. So number one, you got to get on your own side. There's no replacement for that. Number two, just step back from it witness it rather than being identified with it. Third, uh, recognize the cost of it in a clear-eyed kind of way. You know, help yourself become disenchanted with it. Help yourself realize, yeah, it brings some benefits, but at a huge price. And there are other ways to accomplish that function. Like Tim Ferriss was saying, you want to be able to cut. Okay, that's a function. But if you don't have to cut your own hand while you use your knife. You can get a, a sheath or whatever it is, a, a handle for that knife. Um, so that, and then last, again and again and again, experience and then internalize that other way of being. Experience the state of, let's say, being encouraging with yourself rather than mean and um, demeaning and you know destructive towards yourself. And when you have that experience, let's say, of being encouraging, okay, you fell off, 
you did it wrong. You messed up or it didn't go well. Um, okay. Bummer. Whew. Pause. All right. What am I going to do now? You know, and then you start to encourage yourself and in a hopeful, positive way. Well, when you're having that experience, for example, really register it so you know what it feels like. So increasingly, that way of being that's new inhabits you. And in effect, you inhabit it. It becomes more natural to you, right? And after a while, as Melarepa put it, nothing leaves. You know, it's just your natural way of being. It takes repetition. And the more that people are, you know, wrapped up in an old bad habit, as it were, the more repetition they need, the more reps, as it were, we need to do uh, to shift into a new way of being. There's no replacement for that. But literally, really, within a few weeks, if people are, are serious about their practice at the level of five minutes a day, you know, I... <laughs> I have to like grovel to get people to give. They walk into my door. They're miserable. They're making everybody else miserable around them. They're living it. You know, they're taking months, if not years off their life by their just their way of being. They thoroughly agree with all that. And I can't get them to do something that they say, yeah, I ought to do that, doc. And it feels good when I do it. And it works. I can hardly get them to do it for five or 10 minutes a day. But if we do give it those five or so minutes a day, it can really make a huge difference very soon. And a lot of evidence for that neurologically, you literally will be changing structures and functions inside your own brain. And as the weeks go by, those changes are actually measurable, even with current neuroimaging technology, which is fairly primitive compared to what it will be, I'm sure, in 100 years. How does the brain change when you adopt some of these simple practices? Yeah. A great summary saying from the Canadian psychologist Donald Hebb's work, neurons that fire together, wire together. So literally new connections form, quick summary, in your brain and mind right now, uh, close to 200 billion cells, about half neurons, half support cells, ballpark. A typical neuron, uh, 85 billion or so of them, makes several thousand connections with other neurons, which gives us a network inside our head with several hundred trillion literally, little microprocessors. You know, the the term, you may have heard it, this use for the brain is that it's an enchanted loom continually weaving the tapestry of consciousness. Pretty cool, right? Okay, so new connections form. Literally, these little tendrils start reaching toward each other in a time scale of minutes as new learning in the broadest sense, um, new habit formation, let's say, is occurring. Existing connections get stronger or weaker in beneficial ways, depending on what you're learning. New tendrils of capillaries uh, bringing blood and oxygen and glucose to, you know, supplies to busy regions increase. Uh, Neurochemicals like dopamine, serotonin, oxytocin, natural opioids, natural endorphins uh, start moving into, uh, you know, those ebbs and flows change. Uh, connectivity changes between different regions, epigenetic processes whereby the regulation of genes change and so forth. So those are just some of the major ways that literally the structure and function of our brain is being shifted by where we rest our attention and then how we relate to what we're experiencing at the time. Unfortunately, the brain has a negativity bias. It's like Velcro for bad experiences, but Teflon for good ones. So we overlearn. We overlearn from self-criticism. We overlearn from comparing ourselves to others and feeling inadequate or that we've climbed the slippery pole, you know, and we're better than them. But whoa, if we take our eye off the prize, we'll slide back down in a moment. uh, You know, Um, we overlearn from those kind of experiences and we underlearn from ordinary beneficial experiences of success, accomplishment, worth, connection with others, of feeling good about who we are. So we really need to help ourselves take in the good, I call it, take in the good of the beneficial experiences we're having. I love that. I wanted to ask you about lying. I run lying into down people- on the floor? I like to lie On down. the floor. We no. can do the rest of this podcast on the floor. <laughs> yeah. You mean lying. This is I, good. I run into people <laughs> fairly frequently who claim to be really into something or they claim to have done something. And th- I then find out later that they were lying or they were embellishing. 
and that this relationship with the truth is um, tenuous at best. And I think that our society currently um, incentivizes that because it incentivizes people, you know, climbing that that ladder as quickly as possible to get quote unquote successful. And there are a lot of shortcuts that we can take um, and a lot of, you know, uncomfortable situations that we think we can avoid by bending the truth. And I think that the more we do that, just, just as you said in, um, in regards to passing mental states become lasting neural traits, it becomes a lot easier to lie to the mm. point where I've met people who are lying to me about something. And I think that they don't know that they're lying. Yeah. And meditation seems to be one of the most powerful tools for grounding down and not rushing yourself, not trying to get from here to there. Yeah. I think that a lot of people lie because they're trying to get something and they're afraid that if they tell the truth or live in integrity in a situation, then they're not going to be able to get there. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering if you could speak to lying as a whole and mm. the relationship um, between yeah, meditation and truthfulness. Mm. Wow. That was a lot. It, it was a lot, fantastic. but yeah. yeah. I, I, and I'll just really? give just, just one more kind of underscore yeah. um, is that I still find myself lying in little ways from time to time. And it's only when I meditate that I realize I was doing that. And people who I really look up to, like Sam Harris, uh, Adi Ashanti, seem to have a more clear relationship with the truth than most anyone else I come across. And mm -hmm. they're both deep meditators. So that's why mm -hmm. I added in the, the meditation component as a potential antidote to lying. So much about that. Um, the worst person to lie to is yourself, of course. Or your mom. And, well, <laughs> that too. Oh, boy, so much about it. Um, you know, I think of the ways in which in the both science and in the world's wisdom traditions, there's profound respect for truth. And in the Buddhist tradition, which is the one I'm trained in most, uh, there's this deep notion that the root of our suffering is ignorance or delusion. We're lying to others, we're lying to ourselves, we're lying about the way it actually is, right? And there's a reverence for truth. Uh, in my own family system, where there was a lot of, not so much lying, but a lot of um, falsehood about the way it was, and it was really confusing to me. And I found refuge in, I, in the way I put it, is that the most fundamental altar I bow to is reality itself. What is the case, right? And that's one thing I think that um, intense athletics, let's say, uh, particularly when there's danger involved, uh, there's not a lot of danger in playing golf, let's say. I mean, some other, other else's ball might hit you, but it's different from big wave surfing, say, or big wall climbing. And those environments teach a deep respect for the truth. The, the wall doesn't care how you feel, right? The hold is what it is, and you can either stand on it or you can't. It, it, it's just so I, I, I'm really glad you bring this up. It's sacred. And I think one thing that's happened in our culture, especially through social media, is that the truth has become debased. And I've wondered somewhat about how that's happened. What are the enabling conditions of that? And part of it is we've left behind living together in small groups in which there was common truth. When you live together with people day in and day out, they can bullshit you for a few days, maybe a few months, but it becomes very clear to everybody what's really going on, who's pulling their weight, who's not, who's actually having sex with who. It becomes really pretty clear. And that's an absolute basis for survival as a Stone Age band 
20,000 years ago. But these days, it's really easy to blow up common truth, especially when people are farther and farther apart. Uh, People's reputations can be built or destroyed on lies. And then you have other people, I think of them as social freeloaders. Uh, In small groups, freeloading gets recognized and punished, which is an enabling condition for the emergence of altruism. Almost no other species is altruistic like humans are. And the enabling condition for our, for our altruism is that reputations could be known and talked about and freeloaders could be punished. So they knew there would be consequences for ripping off other people who were generous, right? But these days, social freeloaders don't pay a price. In fact, they can rise to the highest office in the land, if you think about it. And um, what are we going to do about that? I, I think part of it is to have the moral courage to confront bullshit, frankly, and to confront people who are sloppy with the truth and to let them know that there will be a price. Maybe they just slipped, you know, they slipped, they kind of fuzzed it, they slightly exaggerated. Okay. Or maybe they use language in a looser way than we do. All right. So we talk back and forth about it. But by the third time you discover that someone significant in your life does not have a commitment really to the truth and they won't tell the truth about not telling the truth, then if in my book, that is a very, that's an untrustworthy person. And that's a, that's, a, that's a dangerous person to invest in or be vulnerable to in any meaningful way. And, you know, there's a term in psychology called altruistic punishment, where, where people uh, take one for the team that costs themselves, but they do it for the sake of the greater good. And I think my hope is that we will restore more respect for speaking in good faith. We can disagree with each other. and We don't all have to have the same set of facts, right? And we, you know, we talk, but there's a good faith process to it. Uh, and you can see that in, in your personal relationships. But I, my hope is that we really uh, will restore more appreciation for the truth and more uh, respect for it and more willingness to be courageous to call out social freeloaders. Yeah, and it does take courage because it's a lot easier to just let that person lie. Um, What would you say to someone? What do you think is the moral responsibility for calling liars out? I think sometimes you just recognize that you don't have the horses. You don't have the guns, as it were, in the situation. The fix is in, and the best you can do is protect yourself or those you immediately care about. And sometimes uh, just for, it's like what, like, it's extremely hard for me to lie, right? I can, I've just really trained in right speech and so forth. I don't say everything, but what I do say, I think is actually the case, right? On the one hand. Um, On the other hand, gosh, Sometimes if someone has a gun at your head, I don't think we have a duty to that person to tell them the truth about where our money is buried or, you know, who's in the basement right now. And so that part I think is true. On the other hand, it's very powerful to just look at someone who's lying or bullshitting and just look at them. And you know that they know that you know they're lying. And that has tremendous moral weight, just that calm, unintimidated, fearless gaze. Uh, There's a saying, uh, one is wise who is peaceable, friendly, and fearless. So it has that fearlessness. That fearlessness is a price that other person is paying now. They're being witnessed in a fearless way by you. Maybe you're not saying a single thing. Or maybe you talk about what happened with other people, not framed as gossip, or trying to, you know, venge, have vengeance on that person, but just, hey, did you did you hear what I heard? Am I off here, or was that just a pack of crud? Was that a load of BS? Like, what? Did that person actually really do that, or are they just padding their resume? You know, can we trust them in the future? How do you feel? So there's a place for that social support, and I think also there's just a place where you look at someone. Maybe they're a friend. Maybe they just slipped. You give them a chance to correct. 
right? I think it's so important to repair. Relationships are grounded in repair. We have to repair. They're not perfect. We've got to keep repairing. So you give the person a chance for repair and or you even give them a chance to repair the lack of repair. But at some point, you recalibrate the relationship. And for me, the way I put it is you shrink it to the size of its true foundations in objective reality. Uh, and uh, so there are people in my life that I'll never do business with again because I don't trust them to do business with me. Or I will just not trust to you know, have a few drinks with them because they go off the deep end. I just won't do that. Or I, I have a good friend, dear fellow. Um, I'm just not going to talk politics with him. Can I say <laughs> He's working with a really different set of quote unquote facts, you know, than I am. Uh, so I shrink, you know, you shrink the relationship and to reserve to yourself the right to do that. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. I, and I, I think that having people who have a solid relationship with the truth is so much more important than agreeing and having a set of friends who maybe are on yeah. different sides of the aisle politically or have different interests it's all really subsumed by an ethics and a relationship to honesty um i found that when i was a kid a lot of my friends were friends because they liked to surf Mm -hmm. whereas now i have such a diverse group of friends and the, and the, the qualities that i can see as consistent is um sense of humor and relationship to the truth. That's really well said. And you could feel it around someone. Are they true blue? Like um, my family, my dad's side is in the Midwest, mainly North Dakota, Colorado, and they're true blue, right? True blue. And I would trust them honestly with my life. I know that they would step in and they would hold the rope right? They would hang in there with it. Even if it burnt their hands, they would hang on to it. And that's incredibly deep, isn't it? To feel that in another person. And I think part of that is people who are tested, you know, that true blueness. And when I think about it, I could just see it in you right there, Kyle, and I could, you know, sense it in uh, people I know well. Um, I I think of it to people I know in the military and in law enforcement who've been tested, right? There's some kind of core of steel inside them because they've been tested and you can count on them. You, you like push against them and there's a, there there. A lot of people who have made it through drug addictions as well have that. Yeah. Wonderful. Absolutely. Right. I have a a friend who had to get sober and, um, I've talked to him about that process and, and I actually went to an AA meeting with him and to see the humility in that room and people talk about how they have just been brought to their knees and they've hit rock bottom, um, I think allows a kind of honesty to come forward the same way that living poor for six months can make you less afraid of being poor. If mm-hmm. you take six months and you just live in a tent and you only eat yeah. rice and beans and you think, okay, this is what would happen if I lost everything. It can make you less afraid of that repercussion if you've experienced it. That's totally right. Um, you know, in a way, we're talking about the courage to be vulnerable, right? The the willingness to sort of be open to whatever happens. And the question then becomes, what enables a person to have that kind of courage? Right. So let's let's talk about that because it, let's yeah. say that you are holding a lie or you have found that you've developed a relationship with the truth that is less than 100%. And I'll just, I'll just talk about it personally, like things that I have done I and then I realize like I kind of embellished that story a little bit or I – downplayed that experience in a way that just kind of feels icky, but then it feels really scary to, to like out myself or to like reorient to that relationship with the truth. It just seems a lot easier to kind of push that experience under the rug and keep moving forward. Um, What would you say to, to someone who's in that position? Um, the most helpful way to kind of um, 
reorient and turn a relationship with truth into a mental trait. Hmm. Wow. A really, really deep thing. I, what we're talking about in a way. You thought is, you were just um, talking to a surfer. I came at you sideways. <laughs> no, no. I, I was psyched about this, really. So, I, you know, it's funny. So I, I'll do conversations like this, and I've got my talking points lined up sometimes. And it's cool. They're, they're genuine, useful things to say. You're asking about things. You're raising things. We are talking about things that... I don't have any kind of prepared talking points for for better or worse. So, A, the depth of what we're talking about, to me, is one way as an indicator is to appreciate that of, of his path of practice, right? A path leading to the ultimate of awakening, hopefully. Uh, the Buddha laid out eight elements to it. So that's a short list. What's the, what are the eight, right? What would be your eight if, as it were, if you were a teacher, trying to tell people how to become enlightened, but along the way, live a good, happy, meaningful, contributing life. And he allocated one of the eight to wise speech. Right? And speech is wise that is well-intended, beneficial, true, timely, and not harsh. And if possible, welcomed by the other person, but it's not a necessary condition. And so this is really central. For me, I will ha I'll have times, honestly, where I rewound what happened and I'll wince when I think about the way I slipped on a word or I, uh, frankly, went for it's called a narcissistic supply. I went for a little bit of, a, you know, a cheap laugh line with people or a little bit of, you know, making myself look good, a little bit of preening. And nothing like a good hum humble brag, we call it. <laughs> Well, that might be one of them. Yeah. Right. Like, oh, I'm so busy these days. Right? Yeah. Like we were talking about. Uh, and, you know, there are times where you just rewind it and you think to yourself, would it be skillful to go back to that person or to send an email to the 50 or 100 people who are at that thing and confess? No, it wouldn't really be skillful. It'd be weird and get more complicated than it needs to be. But deep inside, you can feel it yourself. There can be that wince of healthy remorse inside oneself. And I think that capacity to have a wince of healthy remorse is really fundamental. I I am not comfortable being really invested in people who don't have that capacity. I think that's central. And when I think about people who are world-class bullshitters, <laughs> they just don't seem to have that capacity for the wince of healthy remorse, or they're so terrified of it. They're so unwilling to risk feeling it at all because they've built up a huge bank account of well-deserved shame, guilt, and remorse, that they don't let themselves feel it at all. So that, to me, is a key element. Can you feel it for yourself? Can you be honest with yourself? And then you can you put in correction for the next time? Uh, that really pops out for me. And then I, you know, for me, one of the huge breakthroughs uh, in my kind of 20s, uh, I was really socially awkward, uh, was I began to realize that one of the strongest things I could do was to be vulnerable in front of another person. And in a weird way, one of the things that was best for me was to stop thinking about what was best for me and to open into really being available to the other person, really, you know, like they could affect me. They could, they could get to me, right? And that, would, that changed it. Right. That shifted it. Instead of feeling like I was a weakling or that I was going to be annihilated, it shifted for me. And I realized, wow, the noble thing, the strong thing, and this, frankly, the wisely self-interested thing is to be actually vulnerable to another person to cop to my own crap, you know, and to, and to acknowledge fault as like I've been married a long time now. And one of my little sayings is, is acknowledge fault. Uh, and move on, you know, as fast as I can to admit it when I messed up. Uh, that's besides being, you know, benevolent and good for other people. That's really smart for yourself too. I don't know, what do you, how do you do it? What do you do? I have a friend whose mom works in hospice and she talks about how when people die, there's this massive gulf between their emotional states. There's 
people who meet death with grace and there are people who go out kicking and screaming. So in regards to, to developing my own relationship with the truth, um, I am I am terrified of potentially being in the situation where I meet death and can't do it with dignity. Like that scares me more than just about anything. Mm. And I have a um, a prediction that the less honest you are throughout your life, the more terrified you are to meet that moment. Mm. Um, so so part of it comes out of 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 that, just like wanting to be able to look back on my life and be stoked on myself and love myself. Um, and part of it also just comes from a, the place of realizing that when I, um, wh- when I'm honest, it tends to work out better long term. Um, and even if I can kind of skirt something short term, um, there's an explosion that happens later. And I've I've had a few of those experiences where I've lied, and then it's just exploded after, and and I've taken those learnings and been like, oh well, not going to do that again. Also, as a as a podcaster, I talk a lot <laughs> to <laughs> to a lot of people, and um, th- that relationship with the truth, I think, is is super important. I think it's the only reason that I deserve to have any kind of od- audience is if I'm honest with them. Um, so it's a good incentive to be honest, um, is to go get a podcast. Do you ever see the film almost famous? I love that movie. There you are. And what's that classic line? Uh, you need to make your reputation off of being honest and, um, unmerciful. Yeah. And there's a related to that. There's a line, the, the that's along the lines of the only real currency in this messed up world is who we are when we're not trying to be cool. It's said so much better than that, but it's it's really about the the realness of it all, you know. And I have no idea, Kyle, if this is going to be useful or you're going to want to cut it. But what's coming to me about this when we talk about the truth is. You could say surface truth, deep truth, or um, the way I, a metaphor that's really central for me a lot in my own practice and, and writing these days is eddies in the stream, waves, as it were. So the waves, I'll, I'll use, I'll frame it that way. So there are the waves and there is the ocean the waves are moving through, right? So for ourselves, we have the waves of experiences, waves of thoughts, waves of words, language, and details of whether the words we're using map really, really closely to what's actually the case of our own experience or the facts out in the world or whether they don't. Or... And meanwhile, there's always the ocean. Or to put it in our own experience, there's always our underlying being, being as process, being, okay? And I think part of this here is gets at being comfortable, maybe this is where the point you brought up earlier of meditation really, really comes in. Uh, whether it's through meditation or through other means, being comfortable increasingly with being and identified increasingly with, call it awareness, call it presence, call it just the ground, you know, or just your own personal sense of ongoing being, identified with that and less identified with the passing thoughts or, or words or, or feelings we're having. So then we become less caught up in trying to manage our presentation, you know, our supercut that we put out to the world all the time, right? Less caught up in that and more rested and just screw it. What's underneath it all, right? Makes life a lot more simple. Yeah, I had this sort of saying to myself, love the eddy, be the stream. Yeah. I wanted to ask you about your writing process. Um, have you read ah, the book do you have Sapiens? A book in you? Oh, do you have a book in you? I write uh, a yeah. lot. And yeah. um, I specifically wanted to ask you about your 
your writing process in relationship to meditation. I was listening to a podcast with Naval uh, Noah Harari, mm -hmm. the author of Sapiens, yeah. and he goes on um, multi-month silent meditation retreats every year. And for anyone who's read Sapiens, it's uh, they'll know that it is a very big book, and there are a lot of huge ideas that he needed to hold in that and then make it come together in a cohesive story. And he says that he could not have written a book like that without the practice of meditation. I wanted to ask you about your writing process and how meditation has influenced it. Hmm. Well, I, I started meditating in 1974 off and on, really on for the last 30 or so years. And so it's just part of my life, right? And I think a person also can be meditative increasingly as a trait uh, as they go through their day. And that, you know, not giving myself credit, just factually. So I'm just trying to reflect on your question here. So, hmm. I think in writing, I don't know how it is for you. There's this process where it's like we go into the words, kind of into the craft of how do you string words together and sentences and all that. And then we step back kind of, and for me at least, getting in touch with the body and there, whether something has the ring of truth or whether there, and, and also for me, writing is very much about uh, a kind of, conversation with another person there's an imagined other uh and i there and um and i want to be useful for that imagined other and so it's it's relational it's a relational process so it's kind of like going into the words at the technical level of getting the words right and uh being sure they're accurate and then stepping back into the feeling of it right the including the felt sense of the other and are they with me? You know, am I offering value? Are they getting bored, understandably, with how I'm rattling on here? And so I think that it's great talking with you, Kyle. There's so many really neat things you're bringing up. Uh, for me, at least, that capacity to step back and to drop into my own body in, in a very nonverbal way, interestingly, to pull out of language into feeling and sensation and relationship and intuition that capacity to rest in that and to sort of be open to what could bubble up, you know, from the depth, especially given what I write about, right? What could bubble up as a wisdom coming up and through, not my own. Uh, that has definitely been furthered by meditation. Absolutely true. I think meditation has also helped me. I think Anne Lamott has a line. She's a you know very su successful, excellent writer. She says any good writer has to be willing to kill their little babies. <laughs> that willingness to <laughs> be detached from oh, it was such a good sentence, or oh, it makes me sound so smart, you know, <sighs> yeah. You know, and I think the meditation definitely has helped me in that regard too. How about, I how had about that you? experience. You, yeah. The, yeah, I had that experience this morning. I write um, often for uh, a few different magazines. And um, one tertiary benefit of having this podcast is that I get to sit down with a lot of great authors and then cajole them into reading my work, um, <laughs> which is just the best. And um, this morning, I uh, was going through a final round of edits from a writer who's super accomplished named Steve Hawk, who uh, was the editor of Surfing Magazine for a number of years. And he's nice enough to read my work. And there was a whole paragraph that I had in there. Um, it was a story about um, going on my first turkey hunt in Santa Cruz, which happened recently. And he, he wrote a comment in here and and in the, one of the paragraphs and just said, Kyle, it's good writing in this paragraph, but it has nothing to do with the story. <laughs> I was just like, damn it. And, I, and then I, I replied and I said, yeah, I really just liked that one sentence and wanted to keep it in. But I, it, it was just, 
from me wanting everyone to know how clever I am. And it really did have nothing to do with the story. You're right. <laughs> it is true. Yeah. Um, the, you know, Hemingway's line, I think, is something like, write drunk, edit sober. Yeah. I think, do you, yeah. do you um, write... Uh, I, I I liked what you said about being, you know, so close to the words at a certain point and then having the practice of stepping away and being yeah. able to see it as a whole thing and, and feel it in your body. You know, how does that sentence feel? Not not just what do the words look like? Um, how can you rem remain um, unattached to it in a certain way and, and have that awareness to let go of um, certain parts of your writing? Um, I was wondering if you if you could just speak to your your process going through a, a piece. Will you sit down all day for many days on end until it's done and then fire it off? Will you write in the morning and then come back to it a few days later where you can see it from a different perspective? What are the um, practices that you've developed um, that you found to be most helpful? I think it will. So it depends on what I'm trying to write. So if, if it's a book, then you're pulling together 50, 60,000 plus words and you're trying to make it coherent. On the other hand, maybe uh, you're trying to write like a 600 word blog, say, and it's a different form. So that feeds into it a lot. Um, there will be something I want to say. Or there'll be something I'm, I'm really, mull, really mulling, like what to, what to say about this or what to do about that. And intuitively different responses will arise when I'm exercising or just hanging out. Uh, I, I just reflect on, it. I think a little bit like the little I know of musicians who, you know, they can hear the song and they're playing with it. They're noodling away at it. Uh, you know, <laughs> our son recently said, it's the sound of dad not listening. <laughs> you know, like the sound of me not listening. In a way, they could tell when I'm just sort of internally preoccupied uh, with something I'm working on. So there's, I guess, that part of it. In the writing of it, uh, I'll sit down and uh, sometimes it will be astonishing how much time it takes to come up with a paragraph. It, it'll be deep, mind-blowing. Other times, it'll be very fluent. You know, a lot of stuff will flow. Uh, I'm a, I'm someone who likes to edit his work, uh, and I believe in the craft of editing. And it's the fifth draft that really sings. You clear away the dead wood. You know, the line from Elmore Leonard uh, that he was asked once, how did you become so successful uh, as a fiction writer? He said, I eliminate all the words that people skim over. And that really characterizes his work. There's a certain... And, and I try to write in that way as well, to just clear away, clear away, clear away, and, and, and get right to it. Uh, I guess that's very much my process. So I, I like to edit. I, I love that phase. You know, I'm, I'm notorious with my publishers. I say, no, I, I really, we have to build into the contract this cycle where you send me what looks like the book, which will force me to see it with fresh eyes beginner's mind, you know, Zen mind, beginner's mind with fresh eyes. And then uh, I'll hand edit it on the actual page. And then I'll either input those edits myself into Word or they will. Back in the day, they would do it. You know, publishing's come a long way in the last 15 years. So I guess that's my process a fair amount. Um, I like the craft of editing. And really deep down, I, for me, there's no replacement for keeping the reader in your heart. They're with you. You got to bring them along with you. They're real people. What do they need to know right now? What question would naturally arise in their mind? Uh, in, in the rhythm, you need to move, maybe because I write nonfiction, self-help, to move back and forth between didactic and something that's more concrete and experiential. Uh, and then how do you drop in just enough hard science stuff to appeal to that person? It's a little bit like teaching. I, I don't know if you teach surfing or teach stuff, you probably do. I have many times. Okay, so the way I think of it myself is we teach to the center mass of the distribution while trying to bring the tails along with us. You know, like the bell curve, the center mass of the bell curve. You, you, you have to teach to the majority of people, depending on your audience, whatever it is, while not leaving out the people at either end. 
of the of the range, right? And so I try to do that as a reader too, as a writer too. You know, where you're, for example, bringing along people who want more of that hard science part. You know, what's the evidence for this? But not so much that it becomes not useful. Um, yeah. And last thing I'll just say about it is that it, ultimately the one reader you really need to write for is yourself. That years later, when you go back and you read it, you think to yourself, that was pretty okay. That was all right. Right. And I just think it's okay, actually, as a writer to sort of insist on certain things. Maybe it's a story about hunting turkeys, I guess, uh, or one of my favorite fiction books is by John Steinbeck, Sweet Thursday, beautiful piece of writing, a lot of lovely stuff in it. And he talks about how there's just a place sometimes for kicking out the jams as a writer and letting yourself bust out with some flowery language. And if a reader wants to skim that paragraph or that half page, you know, they can do that, but you're going to bring it in because you want to, <laughs> and you're the artist, you know, it's like Michelangelo. I don't know. He put that thing there because he wanted it there and we're all staring at it. Why is that flower growing out of Adam's navel or whatever? That's not the case actually, but something like that. Well, he wanted to do it. When you edit, do you print out your work and go through it with a pen? Yeah, I like to hand edit because uh, I it makes me see it differently. I think a lot of what's important uh, in terms of writing is jarring yourself out of a familiar frame of reference. That's where readers come in. That's where editors come in. Uh, it's also important, I think, to remember that most people are not very good editors. <laughs> Even professional editors are often not very good at it. And uh, to reserve to yourself the right to say, no, there's nothing wrong with this sentence as it stands. You didn't understand it, right? Or, you know, some people like a little curry in their pea soup, like me. Other people like our daughter, I made pea soup last night, no curry, right? Okay, it's a matter of personal preference, but if I'm cooking, there's gonna be some curry in it. If if only I'm gonna eat it, which is the case actually with what I just made recently. So to reserve to yourself the right to stay with your style and not be pushed around. Uh, on the other hand, um, I think that it's, it's really important to not get attached to our words, to not get attached to our view, you know, invested in view. Uh, Yeah, you know, if I could say one last little thing about it that I, when I reflect on it, is to write what will endure, right? To Maybe this goes to truth-telling. I think there's a lot of, I won't call it, it's not lying. It's, I think of in social media a lot, there's what I call performative authenticity. And if your authenticity is not is performative, it's not authentic, right? It's so, quote unquote authenticity. Yeah, yeah, the yeah. Authentic that's, brand. My, yeah. When, when, when anyone says being authentic is part of my brand, that's how you know it's authenticity in quotes. Yeah, yeah. Like Stephen Colbert's truthiness, you know. Right. Uh, so I, I just feel like there's a place for. Um, being brave in your writing and to have courage in it. It's a special to, medium. To it's such a special it. medium. Yeah. To, to, and to, to be able to say exactly what you mean is yeah. such a beautiful and rare moment, but yeah. there's, there's really no better feeling in the world. And um, yeah, in, in regards to your comment on editors, and no one's going to care about your your work as much as you do. But if you can find an editor that does care about it, oh gosh, it, you can develop a deep relationship very quickly. I've had an editor, one, one in, in the past, who, who's a woman who I've maybe met under five times in, in person to person, yeah. but she knows me better than some of my closest friends. Yeah. I started reading this. So I've got a wrap in a second. Yeah. <clears throat> so <clears throat> my wife got me the Paris review. So it's my quarterly immersion in culture. 
high, high literary culture. And I don't read most of it, but there's always something in the quarterly issue of the Parish Review. So I want to give a nod to the Parish Review here that is just great. So recently, I stumbled on uh, this interview with a guy named Michael Hoffman, who's bilingual, German and English, and he translates from German into English a lot, and he himself is a poet. I don't normally read this kind of stuff. This is way outside my thing. I'll read adventure fiction or true stories, stuff like that. I I read a lot of fiction, but it's more like genre fiction, sci-fi, detective novels, historical stuff. Okay, so this is high culture. And yet the guy's amazing. And I want to give a nod also to this kind of amazingly fantastic writing about poetry, right? So he's talking about, so I don't read much poetry. I definitely don't read criticism of poetry. He writes so beautifully. I want to give a nod to it. Where have they been? I think, where have, where have they been? Where have you been? That's his book. Okay. Here's his line. He said, the best editor, and he's quoting a famous poet, I forget, Stephen Spencer, I don't know. The best editor, the best readers are people who love your work and don't like all of it. <laughs> right? That's a good editor. I love that. Dr. Rick Hansen, um, where can people find you and give uh, a brief summary of your new book that is coming out, please? Oh, thank you. First, let me just say how delightful this has been. Um, fantastic. And if I can support what you do, Kyle, anyway, you know, I want to. Uh, so, gosh, people can find me, Rick Hansen, S O N dot net best place website. I'm also pretty out there on social media in different kinds of ways, easy to find. Freely offered almost everything, a few things for sale. They're inexpensively priced and we give scholarships to anyone with real financial needs. So that's that's me online. And this latest book, I'm going to use a link. I'm stoked. I grew up in Southern California. Uh, <clears throat> it's called Neurodharma, New Science, Ancient Wisdom, and Seven Practices of the Highest Happiness, which really summarizes what it's about. Basically, it's about how can we use modern brain science in super practical ways, informed by the greatest teachings of the ages, to cultivate over time these seven qualities, steadiness, lovingness, fullness, by which I mean equanimity, contentment, a sense of resilient well-being inside. Those are the first three steadiness, lovingness, and fullness. And then the next three, wholeness, nowness, and allness, by which I mean kind of poetically. I let myself be more lyrical in my writing, more poetic uh, in this uh, latest book. Um, The sense of being whole as a person, completely self-accepting, not tussling, that thing I said earlier about wholeness, not tussling with parts, while resting right in the emergent now, right at the front edge of the windshield of consciousness, as is continuously updated um, in the emergent edge of now, as it disappears continually beneath your feet. Like how to do that in a way that's almost ecstatic, so full of delight and like playful presence with the emergent moment, nowness, and then open into allness, the sense of being, of feeling what you know intellectually to be true, feeling that you are a local expression of everything. This thought right now, whatever it is, this thought is the universe manifesting locally, truly. But to feel that, not just to have it as like a woo, 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 woo idea, but to feel it and to feel buoyed and supported by life rather than separated from it and at war with it. That's opening into allness, including what is happening in the brain when people have these radical experiences we started with of flow or oneness and so on. And then last, finding timelessness exploring what is unconditioned, uh, through which conditioned experiences flow, what might well transcend ordinary Big Bang reality, the ordinary Big Bang universe, finding timelessness. That sense of eternity, spaciousness, stillness, vastness, the absolute. So those are the seven qualities. And uh, you can see them really developed in people like, let's say, Adi Shanti, who I respect very highly as someone very far along in practice. Um, And we can feel them in ourselves. I I can recognize them in you. And we can feel that we can develop them further. So that's what that book's about, Neurodharma. And it comes on sale May 5th. Uh, I don't know when this will post. But anyway, that's when it's available. Thank you so much for your time. I really enjoyed this conversation. I did too. Thank you.
Hey, it's Kyle again. Head over to trendswithbenefits.com and sign up for our newsletter to get weekly stories about psychedelics, adventure, and well-being.